So I just want to uh, give a, a quick uh, preamble before we jump in um, that this session is being recorded for all of our friends who are not able to join us live. So if you do not want to be uh, part of the recording, I'd ask that you just leave your cameras off uh, for the session. Uh, I'll let you know when we're done recording if you wanted to turn it on to ask any questions at the end. And with that being said, we are at the top of the hour, so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're tuning in for. In for. Um, welcome to the Earth Month kickoff, Designing a Sustainable Schoolyard. My name is Sydney and I'm gonna be guiding you through today's session as we learn how we can make our schoolyards more resilient um, and really make them so that they, they can be used for future purposes. So when we talk about sustainability, we're really talking about meeting our needs today without compromising the needs of people from the future to meet their needs. So we wanna look generations into the future uh, and make sure that everyone's going to be able to meet their needs. Uh, if you're new to green learning, welcome. We are a national charity with a mission to engage and inspire students like you to create a better world. And how we do that is through free online resources about climate change, energy, and the green economy. All of the resources and content that I'm going to be showing you in today's workshop is from our Flood Ed program, which is all about extreme weather preparedness and its connection to climate change. Um, and so as we go through, if you're curious and you want to learn more about some of these concepts, we have an entire free program that can help you learn uh, and really explore these in hands-on ways. Before we jump into the actual workshop, uh, I do want to just take a minute to uh, show my gratitude uh, and, and thanks for the land that I live and work on. So as you can see, I'm tuning in from my home office today, and I'm located just west of Toronto in Ontario in what's known as Kitchener-Waterloo. This is their traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. And as you can see on the map, um, I'm located on that green strip there. Uh, this is land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River through what's known as the Haldeman Treaty. Um, the Six Nations of the Grand River are the largest Six Nations in all of Canada, and currently their uh, reserve is in that little uh, orange block that you see at the bottom left there. We really look to, to Indigenous peoples during these times, as they are really the, the folks who have been stewards of our lands for generations and are helping to rejuvenate things for the future. So what are we going to be learning about today? Well, we're going to be talking a little bit about flooding and its connection not only to climate change, but to our general ecosystem health. Um, we're going to be talking about our schoolyards and how we can plan and design them so that they're more sustainable, uh, not only to extreme weather events, but to other things such as plastic waste. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to get to demonstrate some things with you. We're going to learn together. Um, and as we're going through the, uh, the session, I encourage you to use the chat quite actively. So I'll be asking some questions, whether you want to answer as a class or you want to put those answers in the chat is up to you. If you don't mind, uh, just changing your Zoom name to uh, the last name that you registered with, just so I can mark you off on our attendance list and, and know that you were here for this session. So my very first question for all of you as we talk about flooding is, have you ever experienced flooding at home, at school, or in your community? And flooding can look like a lot of different things. Um, so it can be really extreme flooding events. Uh, so for example, what we saw in British Columbia this past fall, where we had uh, really high amounts of rain uh, and a combination of different factors that resulted in really extreme floods. Or it could be a basement flood, such as a pipe bursting at home or even at school. Or it could be even as simple as ponding. Uh, so for example, uh, you can see in that far right picture there, water that's not supposed to be there, but is staying there. We call that ponding and it is a form of flooding. Um, and so whether you've experienced really extreme types of flooding um, or maybe less extreme and less damaging types of flooding such as ponding, flooding is something that impacts all of us. Um, and we're gonna learn uh, as we go through how even if we don't live near a large body of water, uh, we can still be at risk for flooding and we can still do things and make changes so that our schools can be as resilient as possible. So to better understand really what is flooding and who's at risk, we're gonna play a little true false game before we get into the demonstrations. And so how this is gonna work is I'm gonna read out a statement. If you think that statement is true, you can give a thumbs up. If you think that statement is false, you can give a thumbs down. Teachers, if you wanna put the consensus of your class, so whatever most of the students decide in the chat, uh, we can get to know what other classes around the country are thinking about flooding. So my very first question is true or false. In Canada, 
fires are the most common and costly, so expensive, disaster in terms of property damage. So are fires the most common and expensive natural disaster in Canada? If you think that statement is true, you should have a thumbs up. If you think that statement is false, you should have a thumbs down. And like I said, feel free to put your answers in the chat. I'll give you a second to think. So you may have discussed that is false. Actually, floods surpassed fires as the most common and costly disaster in Canada over 20 years ago. So for your entire student life, for as long as you've been alive, flooding across Canada has been the number one most common and most expensive natural disaster. And that's something we're seeing all across the world. And so it's really exciting um, that we're dealing with this problem and have the opportunity to address it. True or false? Flooding happens when there is an overflow of water from a body of water or excessive rain onto dry land. So that of course is true. So flooding can take many different types of forms. So it can look like a river overflowing. So the amount of water in that river is coming over the bed. Um, it can look like a basement. There are a number of different types of uh, flooding types, uh, but really what flooding looks like is water where it's not supposed to be staying there. True or false? Flooding only occurs near coastlines, so along the coast of the ocean, or near rivers. That one as well is false. So flooding can occur really anywhere. It doesn't need to be near a large body of water, but of course, cities and towns who are near big rivers or even along the coast are at much higher risk of flooding. But that doesn't mean that flooding can't occur everywhere. And on that note, true or false, climate change has made the risk of flooding higher. So that one is true. Now this connection is a little bit harder to understand than some other connections in climate change. Um, but what climate change is doing is it's affecting a lot of different things that impact water related events. So for example, climate change is meaning that we're having more extreme and frequent extreme weather events. So such as for example, uh, 20 years ago, we may have received a little bit of rain over a couple of days. Today, thanks to climate change, all that rain is now coming all at once. And so it's more of a big dumping of rain than trickling over a number of days. Not only that, but sea level is rising, more extreme weather events means that flooding risk is on the rise. But lucky for us, there's lots we can do about it. True or false, floods have occurred across Canada. So that is true. And actually floods have been documented in every single province and territory in Canada. So here are some examples from BC to uh, PEI and everything in between. Um, flooding has been documented everywhere. Some have been really major floods and some less so. Um, and really more, the more major floods are what we talked about is those happen near large bodies of water because of course there's more water to overflow in those areas. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a bit. Now that we understand a little bit more about flooding um, and the risks uh, we're at here in Canada, we're going to get to know a little bit more about what we can do uh, in our communities and at our schools specifically. So how can we make our schools more resilient to flooding? And right now we're in the middle of spring, which means there's not only lots of rain, spring rain, but there's also lots of snow melt. And so when you look outside, you might see something that looks like this, a big, puddle in the middle of your schoolyard. Now, of course, this isn't great for playing because uh, you'll get all wet and muddy. And so we want to be able to address this. And one of the best ways we can go about addressing this is through what we call stormwater runoff. And to explain stormwater runoff, I have this uh, really nice chart here. So every time it rains, water gets absorbed into the ground. But it really depends on where that rain is landing. So for example, on the left side of this chart, you can see that we've got some beautiful trees and grass and shrubs, really a natural area. So whenever it rains here, that precipitation, rain falls and lands along here and actually gets absorbed into the ground. So some of it, those 
trees and plants and grass drinking up that water. Some of it is just being filtered through the different layers of soil. And what happens is that rainwater, um, anything that doesn't get uh, used up by all the plants here, goes into what we call the water table. So below us, no matter where you are right now, we have a water table that holds the groundwater. And this water table is actually what fills up our lakes, rivers, and streams, or even leads back right directly into the ocean. And so this is how um, rain, the rain system really works. So then this will get evaporated up again and come back down as rain. But that's pretty great too, we all know that stuff. So what's the problem with the right side of this picture? Well, it has a very different landscape. Here we have a really more developed area or an urban area such as a city where we have uh, streets, we have sidewalks and parking lots, lots of buildings and homes and shopping centers, all of which do not absorb water, which means that when it rains on this urban area, that same amount of water does not get absorbed into the ground. There's no plants or, or trees or shrubs who are drinking that water. It's not being filtered through the different types of soils. What happens is that this water actually needs to go down the storm drain and through a series of tunnels actually leads back into the river. And so where this goes wrong is number one is that we're not filtering that water. So here on the left side where it went through all this natural uh, different types of soils and different types of root systems, that actually helps to filter out a lot of toxins out of the water. Over here, we don't have that opportunity. So that water is not being filtered the same. The second piece is that it has the opportunity to pick stuff up along the way. So for example, when it rains, anything that's on the ground has the opportunity to be picked up by that rain and washed along and go down a storm drain. So when we're looking at the example of our homes, and this can be applied to schools or really anywhere that has places uh, that can't absorb water, we're going to see this. So if it was to rain at your house, and let's say you had just uh, washed your car and you had all kinds of soap and different chemicals that you were using to shine up your car or your bike and those things fell on the driveway. Well, the next time it rains, that rain is going to pick up all those chemicals and soaps and it's going to bring them right down into the drain. And again, remember, none of that gets filtered before it goes out into our natural water spaces, such as lakes, rivers or even streams. And so it's really important that we're not only being conscious of what's on the ground and what we're using, but also that we increase the permeable or increase the surfaces that can absorb water. And that brings me to the next piece of our runoff footprint. So when we're looking at the runoff footprint, that really means how much of the water that lands on your surface area is being absorbed and how much can't be absorbed. So when we're talking about these things, there's a term that we need to understand, and that's called permeability. So that's a, a surface's ability to absorb water. And to explain this, I actually have a couple of different uh, surfaces here with me today. So I have some grass, actually these are chives, but it looks a lot like grass. I have some gravel, which is a mix of small rocks um, and bigger rocks and kind of dirt, um, really just a mixture of different things. And then I also have a solid hard rock. Okay, and so when we're talking about permeability, we're really looking at a surface's ability to absorb water. So for example, I have a jug of water here with me today. And um, I, I hope you're all able to see the, the switch camera that I, I have up there. And if you're having any difficulty seeing that, please let me know. Um, so if rain, as we discussed, were to rain on, for example, our chives, that water is going to come and it's actually going to be absorbed by that soil and by that root system. And what's gonna happen is those roots are not only going to slow down the flow of water, but they're going to help filter that water. So then when it comes to the water table and goes back into our rivers and streams, it's cleaned out of a lot of toxins. So we would consider grass and soil to be completely permeable. All the water that lands on here gets absorbed. Now we come to the middle, we come to our gravel. Now this was a bit of an in-between. So of course, rocks don't absorb water, but since they're so small, it does allow water to fall in between them. So when I pour water onto gravel, some of it actually might run off. 
So some of the bigger rocks might repel some of that water. It means that it needs to find somewhere else to go. But a lot of that water is going to get absorbed. This is what we call semi-permeable. So it absorbs some water, but some of it also runs off. And in our last example on the far uh, side over here, the rock, if I was to pour water onto this rock, no matter how much I pour, none of that water is getting absorbed. It's all going to run off. Okay, and so this is what we're talking about when we're referring to permeability. So heading back over to our chart here, we could classify these different areas using some different examples. So a permeable surface that we might find in our school ground might be grass or dirt or anywhere we, where we find trees or plants. In the middle, semi-permeable, meaning some of the water gets absorbed and some doesn't, we find things like gravel, which has those little rocks where some of the water washes off, some of it gets absorbed, or things like pavers, where the actual paver might not absorb water, but thanks to all those little cracks all around it, water has somewhere to escape to. So we kind of put these in the middle as semi-permeable. And then on the far side, we have non-permeable. So these are the surfaces that don't absorb any water, and anytime water falls on these surfaces, they need to find somewhere else to drain to. So those are, for example, rocks, big rocks, asphalt, uh, sidewalks, so anything that doesn't absorb water, okay? And so we're going to be applying this concept and these ideas to the example of our schoolyards and coming up with ideas and ways that we can make our schoolyard more resilient. And in order to explore that together, I have an example, okay? So we're going to be taking a look at this schoolyard here. Okay, so you should be able to see uh, basically a, a diorama of a schoolyard. And so I'm just going to walk you through the different parts of my schoolyard and you can start to think how this compares to yours. So here we have this big square. This is my school building. Okay, my school building is non permeable. And I hope yours is too. So if it rains and you don't get wet inside your school building, it means your school building is non-permeable. It does not absorb water, which means anytime rain lands there, it needs to wash off to somewhere else. You can see all around my schoolyard, all of this black area is asphalt. Some of it's used for a parking lot around my school, and some of it we use for our playground where students play. Over here, this smaller gray box is actually a portable. Okay, also not permeable. Over here, we have some gravel, so some little rocks that are semi-permeable. And then we have our field over here, which is all grass and permeable. So what happens when it rains on this surface? So I'm gonna use my jug of water and just pour here and we can explore. So when it rains in my field area, all of that water gets absorbed, okay? And it gets filtered um, and it goes down into the water table. Now, when water lands on my asphalt or on my portable or on my school building or on my parking lot, none of that water can be absorbed. And you can see it's all draining to one central place in the middle. That's my storm drain. And so when it rains, all this water needs to find its way to this one single storm drain in order to get back into our water system. And this can cause issues. So for example, if there was litter, I don't know about you, but outside right now with all the snow melt, there's lots of litter in my neighborhood. So for example, if there was a piece of garbage that somebody dropped from the portable here, uh, maybe a, a receipt fell out of somebody's pocket when they were running around in the field here, maybe something blew out of a car over here. All of these pieces that are now in our environment, when it rains, have the opportunity to get picked up by that rain and go into our storm drain. So again, if I was to pour water or rain along here, you can see how easy it is for these pieces to get picked up and then washed down into the drain. And actually something interesting just happened where those, that debris did not get picked up and go down into the storm drain. What, what's happening now is it's actually clogging my storm drain. And so what happens the next time it rains is that water is not properly going to be able to, to, to get out. And we're gonna have a backup, which is going to cause some ponding or some flooding in my schoolyard. Now, there are a number of things that we can do to increase or improve the sustainability of our schoolyard. So let's take a look again and look at what our toolbox is of items that we can use to make our school more sustainable. Now, this is not an extensive list. This is just to get us started. 
So some things I could do to improve the sustainability of my schoolyard would be first and foremost is to increase the permeable surfaces. So increase the amount of surfaces on my schoolyard that absorb water instead of repel it. Things like grass or wood chips. Even better if you can uh, in implement a garden. So gardens could either be uh, straight in the ground or garden boxes. And these not only help to filter that rainwater, but can also provide either food for people or food for pollinators and insects and bugs, uh, which is awesome. Of course, we have trees and shrubs, which also help to filter water, but also help to filter our air. And then we have some little extras, such as a rain barrel, which can help us collect water and a solar panel. And we're going to be applying all of these things to our schoolyard. So I'm going to do the first example, and then you're going to get to try on your own using your own school as your example. So when I'm looking at my, my schoolyard here, the first thing I want to do is increase the permeability. So I want to get as much surface area as I can absorbing water. And so what I might do is I might increase the grass area. So I've got some extra grass here, and I'm going to increase my grass area, and I'm going to make my field much, much bigger, okay? So the very first thing I'm gonna to do to make my school more sustainable is I'm gonna increase my field area. Now I'm still gonna leave a little bit of asphalt in case anybody wants to play basketball so we can still be realistic when we're planning for our schools um, and still think about the needs of the people who use this space. So I'm not gonna get rid of my parking lot because people still need to park, but I see an area where I can increase this. What else might I do? Well, looking at my toolbox, I might wanna increase by adding trees or shrubs. So my trees and shrubs are in the form of plasticine. So I might add a tree over here in this corner. I might add some shrubs in the field, maybe along the edge. Maybe I might even add some shrubs around the edge of my parking lot. I can really add these wherever I want, wherever I see fit. Um, and I know what kind of benefits those are going to have. I might even add in uh, a garden bed here so that I can grow some of my own, uh, my own plants. And you know, I'm gonna need water to water those plants. And so I'm actually gonna install a rain barrel right beside my portable. So every time it rains, I'm actually gonna collect all the rainwater from my portable. It's gonna go into that rain barrel and I'm gonna use that water to water the plants in my new, uh, my new garden bed. And so here you can see with just a few small changes, how I can increase the sustainability of my schoolyard. Now, I still have this issue of all this garbage and I still have a lot of space here that that has the opportunity um, to get picked up in. And so what I also might do is I might create a competition at my school where every month a new grade is going to take over the responsibility of keeping our storm drain clean. So once a month they're going to go out and they're going to canvas our entire schoolyard, pick up any garbage or any debris that's out there. Make sure that there's no sticks or leaves blocking this storm drain and that it's nice and clear and that water can flow freely. And each month that responsibility will change so that all throughout the school year, we can ensure that no garbage is going down there and that we're keeping our space nice and clean. And so that's what I'm gonna do to update my schoolyard uh, for higher sustainability. Now, when it comes time to design your schoolyard, uh, I hope each of you have a pencil and a piece of paper. If you have graph paper, even better, but you can also do this with just plain paper. What you're going to do is you're going to do a bird's eye view example, okay? And what that means is we're going to uh, pretend that we're looking straight down on our schoolyard. And I'm going to use a marker for this just so that you can see it nice and well, but you can use a pencil uh, in case you make any errors. So when I'm designing my schoolyard, there are a few things that I can't change. So for example, I can't change where my school is. So I'm going to draw my school in because that's going to stay the same. I'm also going to keep my portable in the same spot and the parking lot here. But everything else, I have the opportunity to change. So I'm not going to bother drawing my original schoolyard here. So you don't have to draw what your schoolyard currently looks like. You can just draw how you would make it more sustainable. So we talked about the fact that I'm actually gonna increase, my, my field is gonna grow in size. So remember it started out pretty small, I'm increasing the size of that. So I can add grass here, okay? I remember I was gonna add a uh, rain barrel here, okay? I added a garden over here, okay? 
and I can start adding in all of these different pieces. Now, some of you may even have playgrounds in your yard. If you're able to switch out those materials for things such as wood chips that absorb better than gravel, you can do that as well. And so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to give you about uh, five minutes to start thinking about how you can design your school a little bit more sustainably. And then we're going to come back together and talk about some more ideas that you can take to, to make your school more sustainable uh, to flooding and other areas. And so right now, what you're going to do is you're going to pull out your piece of paper, whether it's blank paper or chart paper or even lined paper, if that's all you have. And I want you to draw, out first off, the pieces you can't change. So you can't change where your school is um, and any big infrastructure such as portables, you probably don't want to change where those are either. But everything else, you can design more sustainably. You can even think of things outside of the box. So you don't need to limit yourself to the items I listed here. If you have even more ways that you can create a sustainable schoolyard, for example, trading out your plastic playground for a wood playground, more natural materials, that is fantastic to include as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a timer on for about five minutes. I'm going to be here if you have any questions. I want you to start and draw out what your sustainable schoolyard would look like. Uh, and then we're going to come back together in a few minutes. So you have about five minutes. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, and I'll be here in case you need any support. You can do this as a class or individually if you'd like and share afterwards. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, get to designing your sustainable schoolyard. Like I said, if you have any questions of ideas you're considering, um, other ideas that you want to put in the chat for other classes who are designing their sustainable schoolyards, uh, this is a great opportunity to learn together as well.
Okay, you have just over a minute to finish up your drawings of your sustainable schoolyard. Uh, if you need more time, you can let me know in the chat, but after that, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So uh, finish up what you're drawing and the conversations that you're having, and we'll come back together uh, in just under a minute. Okay, I hope that was enough time for you uh, to design and draw out how you would make your schoolyard more sustainable uh, using the concepts that we talked about, about permeability, different surface areas, and filtration. Um, so I hope you were able to add lots of permeable surfaces um, and add natural elements such as trees and shrubs and gardens to help filter water even better. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit, um, and I want to talk about the Flood Ed Challenge. So as I mentioned, if you're interested in learning more about flooding uh, and all of these concepts that go along with it, we have an entire program that is completely free online on our website that you can go to to learn more about this uh, concept. Part of that program is that we actually have what we call the Flood Ed Challenge. Now this is where you have two options. You can either plan for flooding or you can take action for flooding. And either one of these would qualify you to participate in our free challenge where you can win up to $1,000 in prizes, which is really awesome. So creating these sustainability plans is a plan to, to help address flooding. If you wanted to take action, you could do things such as adopting a drain, whether that be on your school property or in the community where you take the responsibility of keeping that drain clean. Even planting things such as gardens, trees, and shrubs are also all eligible activities for the challenge. And if you are looking to take on any of these challenges in your classroom, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I have lots of resources and funding uh, that I can connect you with in order to bring these projects to life. So I encourage you all to register for the challenge. The second piece I want to talk about is that we have a, a full suite of Earth Month activities going on, including a lot of our flooding events. So this entire week um, on this, our, our Earth Month activity calendar, which is free to download on our website, you can see we have a number of different activities that add to what we were talking about today. So for example, tomorrow's activity is the runoff footprint. So when we're talking about our schools, we can actually calculate exactly how much water is going to fall on our school every time it rains. So that's the volume of water. So for example, if your school yard looks anything like mine did and has a lot of asphalt, more than half of the water that falls on, the, uh, on your school is not going to be drained away naturally. And so that's what the runoff footprint helps us calculate. Uh, and we have a full activity that'll walk you through step-by-step step how you can calculate the runoff footprint. And it involves a lot of measuring, whether you wanna measure in person and actually get outside uh, and measure your schoolyard, or you wanna go on Google Maps and, uh, and use the measurement tool. We give you a couple of different options in a couple of different ways. From there, you can take really any activity or challenge that you want from the program. Not only that, but we have all kinds of other activities, including other workshops around art and plastic if you want to learn more. Now, we do have about 10 minutes, and I do want to share with you uh, the winners of last year's Flood Ed Challenge. So what the winners of last year's challenge did, who won $1,000 for their school, was they actually created a guided walking tour, which educated their community about how water interacts on their schoolyard. So for example, they had a big flood in their schoolyard every single year, where they actually had used pylons to mark off an area on their schoolyard where students weren't allowed to play because of the amount of water that goes there. And so they actually created a walking tour that explained to their community what was happening here. They explained the water table that was below us. They even explained the watershed. So for example, 
every time it rains, all of our water drains to one central place, depending on where you're located. Usually it's a bigger body of water. So if you're near a large lake or even a bigger stream or even close to the ocean, you'll know that where uh, that, that, that's where that water leads to. And so all of these activities can help you better understand this and you can take action in that form. The runner up from last year installed uh, rain barrels on their greenhouse to help collect some of that runoff water uh, and reuse it again so that it's not just going to waste um, and going unfiltered back into the system. It's actually being used to water the plants inside their greenhouse. So there's lots of different ways that you can take action uh, on these pieces, uh, which is really exciting. And you can take part of the challenge and join classes from across Canada who are taking action here. Now, I would love to give an opportunity to share, and so I'm going to stop the recording now uh, and open it up that if schools wanted to uh, share the, uh, the work that they